One, two, three, started. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to this uh, seminar, uh, The Pollinator Pathway, Be On It. Um, our presenter today will be Mary Ellen LeMay. Mary Ellen is the Director of Landowner Engagement for the Aspetuck Land Trust. She's also on the steering committee of the Pollinator Pathway, and she's on the steering committee of the Hudson to Housatonic Regional Conservation Partnership. Um, she's gonna discuss today the Pollinator Partnership, which is a network of local initiatives to plant native plants, rethink lawns, and reduce the use of pesticides. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of technical stuff going on behind the scenes, but hopefully this will all work. She's she's presenting by phone through my microphone, and then Kitty is going to advance the slide. So hopefully all of that will work smoothly. So um, you can start, Mary Ellen. Okay, great. Thank you, Kim. Um, and thank you for inviting me to... Um, speak to all of you today about the pollinator pathway. It's one of my favorite topics. And um, uh, I, I just wanted to give you an overview of um, what, what this pollinator pathway is, how it began, um, and what success we've had in rolling it out uh, to different towns. So, um, so I'll just start right away. Um, and the, the, the first slide, which is actually slide two, it says, what is a pollinator pathway? And a pollinator pathway is actually, it's a corridor of public and private properties that provide native plant habitat and nutrition for pollinators. And on this slide, you'll see these three green uh, blobs, which are, um, those are protected open spaces, maybe parks, um, they might be cemeteries. There's something that's got a lot of open space that pollinators can um, visit. And in between that are the, the blue squares, which are our backyards. And because our backyards are in between these green uh, blobs, that shows what fragmentation is. So, you know, we built our neighborhoods um, clustered about and it fragments the landscape. So the idea with the pollinator pathway is um, you know, as you click on the animation, you'll see that the idea is to connect, create a corridor across the landscape. And the way we can do that is if we have municipalities and property owners create pesticide-free, healthy yards and public spaces for pollinators, pets, and families. And, you know, this, this corridor concept um, we know works for birds and, uh, you know, other mammals as well. So we're really connecting almost like sidewalks to allow the movement uh, of, across the landscape. So this concept of the pollinator pathway, um, uh, why we're deciding to do this on the next slide um, three, why are we doing this? Because, you know, as many people have heard about or read in the paper, um, we're in a crisis right now with um, a lot of our insects globally. Um, our pollinators, our monarch butterflies, uh, colony loss for honeybees, um, our native bumblebees are in decline. Um, and the German study that um, Kim Stoner refers to frequently um, in 1989 showed that since 1989, in the last 20 years, they've seen a 76% decline in all flying insects. So this is a real problem. I mean, if you consider, um, you know, a, a, a habitat or a, um, ecosystem as a Jenga game, the base of the Jenga game is the insect population and they're declining. So when we pull out the base of the Jenga game, the whole thing falls. So, you know, people are, are, are concerned about this, but they're frustrated because they don't know what to do. Um, and then on the next slide, um, to focus on uh, from global to local, uh, the bee diversity in Connecticut, um, we have about 349 um, species of bees, and this is Kim's slide. Um, uh, nine species are exotic. The rest are, are native um, bumblebees. Uh, and the honeybees, which everybody tends to think about honeybees, they're native to Europe. Um, they're important pollinators for farms and orchards, but they are not uh, as good pollinators as our native bees are. So we really need to begin to refocus on 
uh, increasing um, the the attractiveness of our habitats for our native bumblebees. And on the next slide, we talk about the threats to the pollinators, which are kind of obvious what we're dealing with in so many aspects of our lives, the climate change, um, pesticides and lawn chemicals um, run rampant and on residential properties, um, they go basically unregulated. Uh, and, you know, that's the problem. You see the guy spraying there and flowering um, uh, shrubs. And that's just in a lot of states, that's not legal for what that guy is doing. I mean, these uh, backpack sprayers um, not only are noisy, but, you know, they're hurricane force winds that are bad for the soil. And then you add a pesticide in there and start spraying it uh, across the landscape. Uh, it's a terrible um, formula for destruction of um, our insect populations. Um, habitat fragmentation, light pollution, invasive plants in the landscape. Uh, and landscapes that have no diversity, like that house there that, that's lawn, um, you know, that's really not providing any resources for um, biodiversity. And in many cases, uh, the lawns are toxic. So the next slide is why do we want to do this pathway here in the Northeast? For the points that I just mentioned, fragmentation of our landscape. We've all been up in plains and seen what the landscape looks like. We have a lot of smaller private ownership. Um, east of the Mississippi, 86% um, uh, of the landscape is privately owned. And that gives us a great opportunity if we change the way we treat those privately owned um, um, plots of land, then we can change the, the whole trajectory of um, biodiversity for a series of species and our lawn culture. I mean, we go through neighborhoods here in the Northeast and it's lawn after lawn after lawn. People are taking down the trees and putting in lawn and it's just, um, you know, it's setting us up for um, a very difficult situation that we need to think about how to get out of this. And the, so the next slide, number seven, is um, what our thought is. For the pollinator pathway for the green corridor, which is um, what I'm working on with uh, the Aspetuck Land Trust, and with our regional conservation partnership, um, is to try and reconnect the habitat. So in scenario A, you see there's fragmented habitat. There are, you know, two open spaces, uh, perhaps protected land, and in between there's nothing. So it makes it difficult for species to move across the landscape. And the idea is if we make our uh, backyards more welcoming and we consider them as stepping stones in the landscape, it will allow again for a free flow across um, the land. When we put in healthy native landscapes that are free of pesticides, it will make our backyards stepping stones um, on, on the pollinator pathway. And so you see the, the bottom right, there's a photograph, an aerial photograph of a house that has, um, looks like native grasses and shrubs in the front and in the back. And it's somewhat connected to what looks like an old tree farm. That in theory is what we're talking about for a house being a stepping stone. If all the other homes around there uh, took even a small, um, uh, it, it, you know, bit of land use practices from their neighbor, uh, we would have a, a greater flow across the landscape. So how do we do this? How do we begin to connect the landscape? So the pollinator pathway emerged from these concerns. Um, and the H2H RCP, I'll define for you, it's the Hudson to Housatonic Regional Conservation Partnership. And um, the regional conservation partnerships are all throughout the Northeast. There are about 48 of them, and they're made up of conservation commissions, land trusts, um, other conservation organizations that get together frequently and talk about how to heal this landscape. So in 2016, our Hudson and Housatonic RCP came up with a conservation initiative um, called the Pollinator Pathway. and it, we started by, um, in that picture, the woman in the blue, Donna Merrill, she came up with the idea of um, 
through a grant from the U.S. Forest Service, getting trees that are really good for pollinators. So her focus was our native dogwood. Um, and she began in the town of Wilton, working with neighborhoods and offering people trees to plant um, from one house to another to begin to create some of these stepping stones to create connect the landscape. And at the same time that Donna started that initiative, um, Dr. Kim Stoner was working feverishly uh, getting our Connecticut Pollinator Protection Law uh, written and passed. And we did not know that was going on. It was just kind of a, uh, a, uh, a, a storm of good things that were happening at once. It was really like the perfect storm. Um, and so in 2017, around February, I invited Dr. Stoner to come to Wilton and lecture on uh, the pollinator protection law and just the, our pollinator um, threats in general. And from that one meeting, uh, launched this pollinator pathway. We started to talk about it, and in the audience were people from ad adjacent towns, and, um, Richfield and Westport and Weston. And people took this concept and just went back to their towns. And a group of us um, that are in the picture below, there's Louise Washer from the Norwalk River Watershed Association. Um, and I'm in the white working at that point for H2H and the Aspetuck Land Trust and Kim. We just kind of began to work together um, talking about how we can launch from town to town these uh, um, pollinator habitats and then connecting them across the landscape. And here we are in 2020, we have over 110 towns in Connecticut and New York, and we are now um, uh, going cross country. We have Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Massachusetts. We've got one in Kentucky, North Carolina. We even have one in the state of Washington. There's kind of scattering across um, the country. Uh, and but our concentration is here in the Northeast. So uh, this has just been a really exciting um, adventure. The next slide gives you an idea of all the towns in the state of New York and Connecticut um, that have joined on this pollinator pathway. And, and um, later on, I'll tell you how people are actually joining and engaging residents to become be on the pollinator pathway. So we have actually gone beyond uh, Connecticut at this point. Uh, but if you see on the map, you, you can see how um, there's kind of a flow across the landscape. The thought was these pathways will connect. Um, pollinators don't know town lines. They don't know state lines. Uh, neither do our birds. Uh, neither do uh, most of our wildlife. Uh, we have to create sidewalks that connect across um, our landscape. Uh, and that's what our initiative was. So. The idea was, the next slide, slide 10, the pollinator pathway is a scalable model. We think this is one of the reasons that the concept works so well, because it is scalable from really small um, pots that are on uh, Main Street to uh, the next um, step, ho homeowners, municipalities, libraries, then going to bigger pots of land, like land trusts or municipal parks. Um, and then looking at nature preserves. So the larger the scale, the more planning is required, the more complexity and the more cost. But anybody can be on the pollinator pathway. Um, even if you live in a condo and you have pots on your, um, on your porch. So it's scalable and that's really why we think it's worked. And the next slide. The message is simple. We have kept a very simple, consistent messaging telling people to do three things. We can't remember to do four things, but three things. Um, and we consistently tell people, number one, rethink your lawn. And by rethinking your lawn, that means maybe reducing the size, mowing less, using organic lawn care. Um, number two, plant native plants. Uh, they bring in the pollinators and the birds, and they are the key to increasing biological diversity. And number three, avoid pesticides. Um, they negatively impact the health of all of us um, and the health of the ecosystems that we are part of. Um, and E.O. Wilson's statement, a world without insects is a world without people, uh, couldn't be more true. Um, and we're facing um, 
you know, some very concerning times if we don't begin to take steps to try and turn this around. Uh, and that's what we're, we're trying to do here on the pollinator pathway. So the next slide, I'm going to go over each one of the messaging points. One is rethink your lawn. Um, you know, mowing less frequently, maybe every two to three weeks that will save water as well. Um, reduce the size by adding more shrubs or pollinator garden. Let part of the yard go natural. You'll be amazed what shows up. If you have areas that you don't mow, um, asters many times are the first things to come up. Um, and it's kind of fun to have a section of your, your property that's not mowed. Um, and you'll see in the summer that those are the areas that um, our lightning bugs love. Uh, at night, you can watch the lightning bugs fly over the long grass and the shrubs. And once they get to the cut lawn, they turn around and they go back <laughs> to the long grass and the, and the shrubs. It's remarkable. I would see it every night during the summer. Um, so that's a good indicator that um, when you don't mow or you leave these little islands, um, it helps the biodiversity uh, in the backyard and insects you see and insects that you don't see are showing up. Um, avoid pesticides, of course, is, is critical. Um, go organic, leave the leaves, and go electric. Um, you know, these gas-powered um, um, landscape tools are, um, you know, there's really nothing good about them. And the, the sound, the decibel level is, uh, is just beyond, um, I think, what many of us can bear. A lot of people are all working from home now, and I just dread when my neighbor's landscaping company shows up. So um, electric is much uh, quieter. Um, so the next slide is why are these lawns so bad and why are they causing problems? Number one, they provide little or no habitat for anything. If you look at this uh, illustration way over on the left, you see the turf grass, which is kind of like, you know, pouring asphalt on your property. There's nothing beneficial to it. Um, and then you take that little, you know, plot of turf grass and then you add fertilizers and pesticides to it, which it can't hold on to. And so we're getting these torrential rain bombs that are washing all this stuff into our rivers and streams. Um, and the root systems are too shallow to filter stormwater runoff. So as we're in the Northeast expecting over time to begin to see increases in, um, in rain volume and intensity, we need root systems to hold our land together. Uh, and the native plants are the ones that will hold the land, uh, not the turf grass. And also homeowners typically use 10 times the amount of pesticides and fertilizers than farmers do on crops. Um, you know, totally unregulated, totally unmeasured. Most people buy these bags of products and don't even read the directions. They think more is better. And uh, it's creating a lot of problems. And the next slide is the lawns use tons of water. Um, in Lower Fairfield County, 40% of the water is used outside. And then in the, in the summer, it jumps to 70%. That's insane. Um, and our lawns suck up 9 billion gallons of water a day, according to the EPA. I mean, our, their, the water is coming out of taking, they're taking water from our, our streams and reservoirs to water um, what is really like green asphalt. That's what our lawns are. So um, it just doesn't make any sense. And it's really in our court to change our practices. So the next slide. Um, I have some examples of some really kind of, I think, innovative um, land use practices. Um, I have these Clover Islands here, which is a friend of mine who lives in, in um, Old Lyme, Connecticut. And I went to visit her, and I was fascinated by the way that um, she and her husband mow their lawn. They leave these Clover Islands, these little pockets. And it looked so beautiful, and they were absolutely buzzing with activity. Um, so this way you can have your lawn is... They walk around as a pathway, but these um, islands are actually very attractive. Um, on the right, there's a bench there um, where the lawn behind it is 100% clover. And that picture I took um, at the Vatican. This was in the front of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, their entire lawn was clover. And it was so beautiful, um, I had to take a picture. And my family couldn't figure out why I was taking a picture of the grass instead of the Sistine Chapel, but 
to me, if this is good enough for the Pope to have clover on his lawn, then we should be adding clover onto our lawn. And yes, I know clover is not native, um, but it adds a great benefit for our pollinators. Um, and it's green and it doesn't need a lot of water and, it's, and it brings nitrogen back into the soil, which few things do. Um, another one I saw there was, um, it was all thyme. This was up in Maine. I mean, the entire lawn, this was at Poland Springs, um, where the water, the water company is. Um, their lawn was all thyme. It was absolutely beautiful and it was buzzing with activity. Um, and the University of Minnesota Extension has done a lot of really interesting work on coming up with uh, seed mixes for turf, turf alternatives, um, including a fine fescue grass, but blending other things like this self-heal, which is a prunella. Um, and we at Aspetuck Land Trust are going to be doing a uh, test site, a bee lawn, at one of our preserves um, using these formulas of uh, uh, seed mixes that we're going to strip seed into the lawn to add more flowers for pollinators. The next slide is avoid pesticides. Um, again, planting for pollinators with native plants and then spraying them creates an ecological trap. That's just, you know, it, it, it just doesn't, it's not, not logical. Um, the next slide, ways to avoid that. Um, spray yourself instead of your yard. Um, landscape to repel ticks, like removing barberry. Um, using tick boxes instead of sprays and garlic oil and MET-52. And a lot of this research has come out of the um, Connecticut Ag Station. Um, it, you know, this is, these are the, the options that people can begin to look at. Um, plant native plants to attract attract beneficial insects. Um, I, I heard a kind of a cool term for dragonflies down south. They call them skeeter hawks because they eat thousands of mosquitoes. Um, and then looking for Omni, OMRI certified uh, products. If you want to or feel the need to use a product, um, a landscaping product, look for the OM, OMRI certification. And of course, our poster children for, uh, for eating ticks um, are possums. Uh, the more possums you have, um, the more they will eat the ticks in your backyard because they are like vacuums. They just, the ticks go on the possums, the possums vacuum the ticks off of them. And uh, I've seen um, statistics of 15,000 ticks a season are eaten by possums. So the next slide is the pesticide policy action alert. So the pollinator pathway uh, steering committee and all the towns are really worried about um, the use of pesticides. And um, so we're so thankful for the work that Kim Stoner has done in the state of Connecticut, making our state one of the few that has the poll uh, pollinator um, protection law. But there are some other things that need to be done, like a, a ban on chlorpyrifos and ending pesticide preemption, letting the towns decide um, what we can do um, at a local level. Right now, we can't do that. So um, finally, the next slide is it's your choice. Um, you can have that yellow sign on the front of your lawn or you can put a pollinator pathway sign. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure how as um, a society we find it acceptable to have that yellow sign out there. I know it's a state law, and, but it's just, um, why is it okay? I, I, I don't know. I think we need a, a, a definitely a change in the thought process of people. Um, and we want to get rid of as many of those yellow signs as possible. And number three, um, so in addition to number one, which was rethink your lawn, number two, avoid pesticides, number three, plant native plants. Um, all of these photographs were taken um, by a friend of mine who lives in Westchester County. Uh, she has, uh, she's an incredible photographer. These were in her backyard. She's got a really small suburban backyard. Um, and the, the, the animals and uh, the pollinators and the birds that show up are quite amazing. So um, trying to get people to understand why natives are important, we, we try to use some stories. And one of the stories that uh, we like to use is the story of two dogwoods. So we have our native Cornish, Florida. Um, which actually supports an entire food web. Um, the upper right corner is a picture of the spring as your butterfly, and that's that's our logo for the pollinator pathway. Um, and the uh, larvae larvae of the caterpillar of 
that butterfly is the caterpillar that's on the slide in the middle. And um, if you look closely, you can see that that caterpillar has a stripe on it that matches the branch of the um, the dogwood. So they're meant to be together. Uh, they're the insects and those and the plants, the native insects and the native plants are meant to be together. Um, and the dogwood opens up an opportunity for an entire um, food web because in the in the spring you have um, the you know the flowering um, the flowering and then in the berries that show up in the fall to feed the birds as they're migrating so this is why our natives are so important as opposed to the next slide which is our Japanese dogwood Cornus kusa now I admit I have about six of these on my property I planted them 29 years ago because I thought they were pretty and I'm not going to cut them down they get these big honker red berries on them which really make quite a mess um, but it does not play host to any North American pollinators. Um, and, you know, we've heard stories that this is actually a food source in Japan for monkeys in their native range. Uh, and the berries are just the perfect size to fit in the hand of that monkey. So that monkey and those berries are supposed to be together in Japan, not here in Trumbull, Connecticut. So I haven't seen any of the monkeys show up in my yard yet, but I wouldn't be surprised uh, these days when the earth's upside down that I might see one someday. Um, and the next slide um, is really focusing on how important these trees are. Um, the dogwoods and all of the trees are meadows in the sky, which I thought was just such a nice um, description. And on the right is uh, Kim Stoner's sample list of trees and shrubs for bees through the season. Um, the pollinator pathway team in every state is using Kim's work. Um, of course, we're giving her um, accolades for this and uh, giving her credit for this work. And this is so important for people to have a very simple visual piece um, like this and the other one that Kim um, developed for the pollinator plants. Um, so trees are just as important um, as the rest of the, the uh, native plants. And the next slide, native versus cultivars. Um, so there have been a lot of very interesting studies lately at UConn, at the University of Vermont, Dr. Andy White and others, um, looking at why native plants um, in many cases attract more pollinators than cultivars or cultivated plants. Um, and it's been fascinating what's emerged. Um, one of Dr. White's uh, um, points was, uh, research points was she looked at um, asters or, you know, basic or everyday New England asters and cultivated asters, which are cultivated to have a different color, maybe different bloom, and watching how the pollinators behave. And they fly right over the cult cultivated one and they go right to the native one. And so, um, you know, the trying to find out why this is occurring. Um, is it because during cultivation, you know, there's just so much energy a plant has. And if you put the energy into a different color of petal or a different um, type of leaf, the energy comes out of the pollen and nectar. And so they're just not as, you know, they're thinking they're not as nutritious in many cases. But there's a lot of factors that are being investigated right now. But um, native plants are um, coming back into vogue, let's say. Um, and the next slide, um, you know, we want to encourage people to plant for specialists. Um, this is an evening primrose moth, which is, you know, very preppy handbook. I mean, look at the, the bright pink and the Kelly green eyes and um, the fact that this moth goes with this flower is just amazing to me, but it only comes out at night. So you can't see the pink. It normally stays in the flower all day. Um, and so, you know, this is a fascinating thing for people to, to actually look out and see what's in their backyard. And these moths like this one that just shows up. And um, Louise Washer, who took this picture in her backyard, now is so obsessed with these moths, she goes out at night with a flashlight uh, waiting for them to come out of her evening primrose. So um, just reintroducing as many natives into your backyard over time with a goal of maybe trying to get to 70 to 80 percent, as Dr. Calamy says, um, will help to increase biodiversity. Um, and the next slide um, 
is, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of an animated slide. So I think as you click on the first, you'll see beneficial insects are his, hidden everywhere. There are insects in our backyards that we don't know are there. And this is uh, a really fascinating one, which I'm sure you probably all are aware of. But um, it's a species that when it's in its first form, it's called an, um, an aphid lion, and it eats aphids. It's a very beneficial insect. Um, and then it, after it eats all these aphids and these other um, insects, it coats its body with the leftover parts of, uh, and, and turns itself into like a, a garbage jacket. It is the strangest thing. And, you know, I've seen these walking across my book as I'm reading, and I did not know what it was until I realized that um, it's a leaf wing and it emerges into this major pollinator. Um, so in its three phases, it's just so cool and it's in your backyard. But, um, you know, until you look, you don't realize um, that it's there. So the next um, the next slide is, um, and the rest of um, my talk is going to be on how to start these pollinator pathways um, in your town or in your neighborhood. Um, and the next slide, it says, um, and so we begin starting a pollinator pathway in your town. And after the last, um, you know, three or now four years of doing this, we've kind of realized that there are very specific steps that each town can take that seem to have been very successful launching a pollinator pathways. Now again, pollinator pathway is not um, it's not a nonprofit organization. It's not a 501c3. It's just a movement. It's simply an idea that's turned into a movement, um, and I think that's why it's worked so well. Um, and if people of towns follow these these steps, they tend to be very successful in rolling it out in their town. So I'll go through each one of these individually. Um, the, ne the next slide is, I'll go over the first step, which is um, convene your team. So um, this is actually the team in Trumbull that I kind of worked together um, to kind of weave together as my team. I looked to local nurseries. Um, we have a nature center in town. I'm the chair of the Conservation Commission, so I didn't have to go far to get myself on board. And conservation commissions in towns are always looking for something fun and positive to do instead of reviewing inland wetland applications, which is a drag. This is a really positive thing that conservation commissions will embrace um, in your town. Uh, garden clubs. You know, we have two garden clubs in Trumbull. There are master gardeners in those garden clubs. And watershed associations. Um, we have um, uh, Metrocog, which is the like five, ten, five town watershed um, team that goes from Monroe all the way down through Bridgeport. Um, so there are these groups in town and we also have an agri-science school. Um, and every town has very different team members. So we're just encouraging you to convene your team, find out what works best for your town and put your town's flavor on your own pollinator pathway. Um, and then the next step, step two, is plan your route. Um, I found this to be a really fun exercise for towns uh, to sit down with your team and roll out a map of your town. I mean, rarely do we sit down and look at, you know, paper maps like this. We can do it online with our, you know, GIS, but it is fun to look at maps. And um, the map on the right side is the map of Trumbull and that green corridor uh, that's highlighted there encompasses the center of town where we have the Pequannock River Valley. All of our parks are there, our water system. It's the uh, watershed for the Pequannock River Valley. So we thought that that would be a great place to have kind of the formal pollinator pathway. But over the last few years, what we've realized is the next slide is that we encouraged everyone to join the pollinator pathway, not just the people along the planned route. So we're finding that this whole concept of planned routes, if you go to the next slide, um, the, the idea was to connect across the town. So if people could look at their map and look at the areas that maybe had a lot of open spaces or the areas that were neighborhoods and draw this kind of ephemeral pathway. It'll just help people to vi visualize the flow across the landscape. 
And from town to town, um, you know, we want to make sure that people connect across the border. So, you know, in Ridgefield, we want them to connect their pollinator pathway to North Salem, to Danbury, to Wilton. And then when you go down to Wilton, they're going to connect to Norwalk and Weston and, and then on and on and on. And this is how we kind of look at the landscape. And you can also share ideas and resources. Maybe you've got a graphic artist that lives in the town next door. Um, they can help you to design some of the flyers or uh, posters or whatever. And then you publicize each other's events. Um, so it's pulling people out of their towns across the border and working together to try and create these pathways. Um, so it, uh, just a, another point about um, connecting across towns. What we're realizing lately is that Towns that had the pathways decided that they want the whole town to be on the pathway. <laughs> so now we have towns like Fairfield and Westport, and, and they said, you know what, we're not going to just draw a pathway. The whole town's going to be on the pollinator pathway. And then, so that makes us connect town to town to town in a broader way. Um, number three, hold a kickoff event. Um, this actually is the presentation in uh, February of 2007 that Kim Stoner spoke at, the Wilton Pollinator Pathway. So this is this meeting was ground zero for the Pollinator Pathway. The audience was filled with people from all different towns, and from there, this movement took off. Um, on the right, this is um, Darianne. They have a, a nursery there that became an only organic nursery. So all of their products are only organic. So they opened up at night and they had this event, um, wine and cheese, and um, people did presentations on pollinators, including the owner of the nursery, he talked about all the native plants that he has. Um, and and it was just a great, it was just a great opportunity for people to, um, get together in a, a different kind of setting. So your kickoff event can be any way that your town wants it to be. Number four, engage community members, corporate partners, town stakeholders, and staff. And this is the fun part because whatever town you live in, you know, there's organizations, maybe there's corporations where you can get some really, you know, young, strong millennials to come out and begin co-invasive and begin to replant the native plants. Uh, plant along the riparian buffers in your town. Get Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts involved. Um, this is a very, um, very positive, very exciting initiative for a town to do. And um, people show up. It's, um, you know, it's really been quite remarkable that this has worked from town to town. The next slide shows uh, sign sales can help raise funds. So this is our pollinator pathway sign, it's a small metal sign that is meant to go on mailbox posts or on a post on your lawn. Um, and it says this property is on the pollinator pathway, um, native plants and pesticide free with the, the website. Um, and people that sign up to be on the pollinator pathway, you know, can buy one of these signs for $5. And this is a good way for a town pollinator pathway to raise money um, to buy plants or to print brochures. And it's kind of fun to drive through neighborhoods and look for these on the mailboxes. Um, the next slide is within your town and within your region, region what's really emerging as a great uh, opportunity is to grow partnerships with um, landscapers, landscape designers. Um, and in my role as um, in Aspetuck Land Trust, um, we've created this landscape professional partnership um, where we have, uh, you know, nurseries, we have lawn companies like Mo Green, we have landscape designers like Growing Solutions, and they become partners, um, whether it's the Pollinator Pathway or the Green Corridor, Connecticut NOFA, um, um, any kind of landscape company, Connecticut Audubon. So these become partners and they help to, um, you know, we can encourage people to go to call one of these landscape designers who can do a native plant um, design on people's properties. Uh, go to native plant nursery in Fairfield where they sell only native plants. These are our sources um, to be able to plant natives and um, get on the pollinator pathway. 
And the next slide is potential sites in your town. You can get these landscape partners to come and do, you know, a site in front of your library with a sign uh, where, where the landscape partner pays for the plants. And then you put a sign there that this site is on the pollinator pathway. Um, golf courses uh, is kind of our new adventure now. Uh, in the last couple of months, pollinator pathway towns that have golf courses have been trying to create partnerships um, with these courses. And, you know, um, those are places that talk, talk about chlorpyrifos. I mean, there's they use that in a lot of places. And that's just something that needs to be managed. And being on the pollinator pathway, you really have to avoid these pesticides. So uh, golf courses can't go on the pollinator pathway until they change their practices. Um, and we certainly don't want them to be left out. Um, the next slide is containers in town. Again, this goes to the scalability of the pollinator pathways in that they can be as small as a pot in front of a real estate company. Um, the folks in the town of uh, Richfield decided that their pollinator pathway was going to be up their main street because they wanted the signage. They wanted every store to put a pot out front with the pollinator pathway sign in it. Um, and you don't need a lot of space for that. And if you follow the recommendations of, you know, three species uh, blooming each season um, and then evergreens in there, this is something that, you know, your local, um, um, you know, your local teams can work on uh, designing and planting. And this is what your garden clubs would love working on a project like this. Um, and the next slide is number five, spread the word. Um, we have found that from town to town, um, spreading the word, whether it's on your town's um, blogs or websites, um, is a great way to link people. Um, now they've got this next door. So next door Hamden, next door Trumbull, next door. It's a way to share information with neighbors. There's a lot of social media out there that can help to spread the word. Um, and there's been some really cool articles like an ed edible nutmeg about the pollinator pathway. Connecticut Gardener Magazine wants to do an article on the pollinator pathway um, early next year. And in the bottom right, um, these are the brochures that um, were developed by each town. We have a standard kind of blueprint that uh, through the pollinator pathway and on our website, any town can get the blueprint, add their own photographs, add their own quotes, uh, add their own um, design to it, and then we provide that for free and then you can print it out. So, you know, Ridgefield, Reading, Norwalk, um, Newtown, uh, all have developed their own brochures, um, which is kind of fun. You don't have to do that, but typically you'll have a quote in there from like the first selectman or, you know, chair of the Conservation Commission or something, why this is important for Ridgefield to be on the pollinator pathway, why it's important for East Haven to be on the pollinator pathway. Um, so spreading the word is really critically important. The next slide is um, the town of Newtown came up with a really innovative concept of a proclamation from the office of the first selectman. Um, so this, of course, got a lot of press. Um, and if you're in an election year, you can get a lot of press with this. Um, but the town has uh, decided that it's formally on the pollinator pathway for all the reasons that are in this proclamation. So this is another standard um, blueprint that based on what Newtown did, um, you can access on the pollinator pathway website and get your town to print out something like this. The next slide is a draft of a town pledge and a proclamation from the town of Westport. In order for people to um, have their properties on the pollinator pathway, they have to commit to doing these things. Of course, avoiding pesticides, uh, planting native plants, putting their address and email so they can be put on the map, and then signing it and then purchasing a sign for $5. And this way, towns can develop maps with points of all of these um, pollinator pathway properties. And this is how we begin to protect, to connect the maps and the town across the state. Um, and number six, <clears throat> stay connected. This is where our website comes in. Um, we have a webmaster, um, Jana uh, um, Ho Hogan, who works at the uh, Woodcock Nature Center, and she's our webmaster 
She's been doing it for free for a couple of years. The pollinator-pathway.org is the website. Um, I encourage you to go on it. There's a lot of great information on there. And each town can have its own page on the website. So we've got a pull-down menu where you can click on Hampton, let's say, or um, New Haven, and it'll open up their page, who the contacts are, and list the events that are coming up in that town. Um, this is free. Um, it's just a way to spread the news. Um, and you can go on this website and purchase yard signs. And it's where all of our resources are. This website is a clearinghouse for our handout, um, our PDFs. Um, Kim Stoner's lists are on there, um, alternatives to pesticides, uh, and all kinds of stuff that's available for downloading and printing um, on the website. So, um, and it's a really pretty website. It's, it's really very well done, and it's constantly updated. Um, so the next slide shows an example of what's on the website. So here's um, Kim's list of wildflowers for pollinators through the season. Um, on the back of that, we've put Connecticut trees and shrubs for pollinators, um, some of Doug Tallamy's information, and then um, native shrubs. Uh, which support pollinators, plant for the queens kind of stuff. So encouraging people to how to start a pollinator garden. These are the things that um, you can look for. Again, this is on pollinator-pathway.org. Um, the next slide, these are uh, the lists by Kim Stoner. And because they're on the website, it allows for you to um, customize it. So for the Aspetuck Land Trust, I customized um, Kim's lists. And of course, um, I have on there compiled by um, Kim Stoner, so we know that she did all the work here. Um, but you can add, you know, I put Aspetuck Land Trust down on the bottom and, and a link to our website. Um, but, you know, these are just really important plans for people to kind of look for. And, you know, it's difficult to find them. And, you know, in my next slide, I'll, I'll show you why, how we're trying to um, generate sources for these plants, but this is an example of um, what people can get on the website. The next slide is Doug Tallamy. Uh, he is our guru. Uh, we follow the book according to Tallamy. Uh, he has spoken in Connecticut more times than I think he'd like to admit, um, but uh, as an entomologist, um, he has really embraced this whole concept of, um, you know, what we're trying to do to bring our um, native pollinators back and all of our native um, insects and especially the importance of um, our, the larval hosts, the trees that we have that are larval hosts for the birds. So um, he's our favorite, is Doug Tallamy. And, and his quote, to share suburbia with wildlife, we need to create these corridors, connecting natural areas, reducing the area in lawn, and begin the transition from alien ornamentals to native ornamentals. And the next slide is the Ecotype Project. This, is, this has emerged out of the pollinator pathway. It has emerged out of the Connecticut Native Plant Working Group, um, which um, Kim Stoner and Judy Preston uh, co-chair. And we've been getting together with that working group for a couple of years now, talking about how important it is to really try and find the seed bank, uh, collect the seeds, and begin to grow these truly uh, local native plants. Um, and the Connecticut NOFA, the Northeast Organic Farming Association, um, joined forces with us. Um, and the Hickory's Farm in Richfield, which is where the NOFA director, um, she owns that farm, uh, Dina Brewster. And we got a local nursery and an arboretum. And so we have um, botanists out in the field collecting seeds from uh, areas that they've gotten permission and certification that, you know, no pesticides were used in these plants. And um, they're, they've been collecting local ecotype seeds. And, and we um, in Connecticut, uh, most of Connecticut, is in Eco Region 59, which actually goes through coastal Connecticut, Rhode Island, coastal Massachusetts, all the way up to Portland, Maine. That's Eco, Eco Region 59. So we've got a big area where 
these seeds can be collected from. Um, and these are the sources of the plants that um, we are trying to propagate and sell. So this is um, all, this whole team here. Um, this is a variety of people. It's a multidisciplinary group. We're at the Hickories in, in um, Richfield and standing in front of a, a, a founder's plot of ironweed. Um, and these founder's plots become the source for the seed that we then sell to the nurseries like Planters Choice in Newtown who propagate these native plants for us. So the next slide gives you an infogram of what this ecotype project is. And again, this is so exciting because it has emerged out of, um, you know, Kim Stoner's um, pollinator protection law because part of the law was uh, that the DOT has to integrate native um, plants and grasses into their DOT landscape. But where do we get these from? Um, and so that's how the working group started to form. And then Pollinator Pathway came on board, creating the market and the need for these plants. And so things are just starting to connect now. Um, and we've got everyone involved from botanists to the organic farmers like um, the hickories where the seed crops or founders plots are grown. Um, then we have our botanists collect, harvest, and clean the seed. And then they go to um, nurseries like, um, you know, we're going to start a relationship right now with Gilberti's, which is an organic farm uh, in Easton, who's known for growing herbs. Um, he's committed to doing um, native plants. We right now have been using for this past year, uh, Daryl Newman at Planters Choice, who has been an incredible propagator of um, these native ecotype plants for us. Um, on the bottom right is the plant sale that we had in June, and all those flats there are ecotype plants, wild collected, propagated by Daryl Newman at Planters Choice, and um, we sold flats of them uh, in our spring sale. And get, getting these plants into the hands of gardeners and landscapes is, it, landscapers is what will help to heal the landscape. And pollinators and birds ultimately will, will thrive. Um, and so we had all these great plants being propagated. And the next slide you'll see um, is we had a, a, a fabulous graphic designer who actually is the person um, uh, her name's Paige Lyons. She developed the pollinator pathway sign with the butterfly. She did illustrations for us, and um, she's currently a master's student um, in landscape architecture. So she is designing planting plans for us, and these are only two of uh, probably six planting plans we have of native garden design, just to make it easier for people. This year alone, we sold over 20,000 ecotype plugs. Um, that were uh, wild collected and propagated, and now they're all over the state of Connecticut. Plus, we sold a thousand native trees and shrubs because the idea is the landscape needs to be have layers to it. Can't be just you know straight lines. It has to have uh, ground cover, then the perennials, then the shrubs, then the trees. So we're we're creating these diverse little um, layered landscapes for people to put in their backyard. Um, and the next slide is um, a project that I'm working on with um, my role in Aspetuck Land Trust and working with Landscape Interactions, which does um, pollinator uh, restoration design and a, um, an entomologist in Massachusetts, Dr. Robert Gagier, who is part of this Beecology project. Um, and we're working together here in this 20,000 square foot area of the Haskins Preserve, which is a nature preserve Aspetuck owned in Westport. And we're creating a variety of different um, habitats uh, that people can walk across the landscape and experience. So um, we, we're having a courtyard garden, which is a scree garden. It's actually a scree garden because there's a lot of gravel there. It was a parking area. And so we're not going to necessarily plant in the gravel, but the, the gravel will become the walkways and we're going to push it aside and plant a kind of a formal courtyard garden using our ecotype plants. Um, we're going to do a bee lawn, like I talked about earlier, with a, a seed mix to create a bee lawn. 
Right now we're preparing a pollinator meadow, which will be seeded in late November. We've got a pond-sized wetland garden or riparian area that we'll be planting in an ecotone transition, which goes from the bee lawn to the woodland edge. Um, that's the area that is, you know, the best uh, source of um, nutrition for birds and, um, and insects. So um, it's a fun project. We're just starting it now. We've been kind of, uh, we'll be working on plants and planting plants over the winter, and it'll be planted in the spring of 2021. Um, and the next slide, I just added this new one because that meadow that we have, which is close to um, 6,500 square feet, is, is all grass now. So we're going to do a test of three OMRI certified herbicides um, because we did not want to use Roundup there uh, because this is a pollinator, um, you know, this is a pollinator study. So we really wanted to use OMRI certified products and also give people an opportunity, give us an opportunity to find out which one of these three works the best so we can recommend them to people um, and I'm sure there at the Ag Station you guys have uh, a lot more information and opinions on these products than I do now uh, but we're just trying to test some of these things in the field and as a land trust um, we need to find something that is an alternative to uh, Roundup. So um, just to wrap up um, I, I liked this definition for courage, and this kind of, uh, to me, typifies what happens with this pollinator pathway. Um, the world looks to leaders to model courage. When your passion overtakes your fear, courage emerges. Courage is acting in the face of fear, standing up for the truth, being willing to take a risk, and actively making a difference. And this is how this, this movement of the pollinator pathway grew. Um, and I think this actually, this definition is good for why you should go out and vote too. But um, so it, it's just been a great opportunity for me and for the people that started this to see how it's grown and to find kindred spirits all over the state and across state lines that are really on a mission to do the right thing um, and do something innovative and do something positive. And now that we're doing these bee studies, um, that that we're going to see the impact of planting these natives. So this the study, the research study we're doing with Dr. Gagir has given us a baseline for what pollinators are there at the Haskins Preserve. Then in the spring, we're going to plant these native ecotypes. And then over the next three years, we're going to measure the pollinators that show up, the bees that show up. And that'll be hopefully our proof that when you plant it, they will come. When you bring natives in, you can help to improve biodiversity. So this was Connecticut Magazine article last September. Um, that was really a very pleasant surprise. Uh, it gave us a lot of uh, press and, um, you know, that, that was a good picture of our four of us out in the field in Wilton. And really the secret of changing things is to focus your energy not on fighting the old, but on building the new. And we've seen what's happened. All of these pictures, again, are from someone's suburban backyard in Westchester where all this stuff is showing up when you plant the right plants. So I'll just close out to say that now it's up to everybody out there to explore and inspire. We'll help to give you the tools, and you take it and add your town flavor to it. And um, more than anything, I appreciate all of you for caring so much about trying to make a difference um, and having fun doing it. So I guess I left like one minute for questions. <laughs> Sorry, it went a little longer than I thought, but um, I hope that was okay. And uh, I'm, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Thank you very much, Mary Ellen. Um, so mm -hmm. we'll pause for a moment for virtual applause. <laughs> um, and uh, we have a couple of questions that have come in. So one is about invasive plants. So what is it that you guys do about invasive plants? Um, that is probably our, our biggest challenge. So, um, you know, we've really, and most of our endeavors have tried to manage them, um, you know, either manually with invasive removal, um, projects where we get volunteers out there and we just begin to, um, you know, cut the, the stems and the trunks of the Asian bittersweet. Um, 
but we have been following uh, some of the guidelines actually from the uh, Connecticut Invasive Plant um, Working Group. Uh, that's kind of been our, our, our go-to. When we come across an invasive, um, that's where we get most of our guidance. So when to mow, if you're going to mow, when to pull or not pull, um, that's been our source is the SIPWIC um, um, spreadsheet for how to invade, you know, manage these. And, you know, one of the ones that's showing up a lot, a lot lately is the um, the Japanese um, still grass and it's just it's fun to pull out now it's really easy to pull out but when you have acres of it um, it's it's tough so you know mowing and mowing and mowing as best we can to exhaust the um, um, exhaust the plant itself and that's why we're beginning to look for alternative herbicides um, to round up because in the past, the land trust itself, you know, we've had acres of invasives and in the past have had to use Roundup. Um, but we're looking for alternatives now and that's why we're doing our, our test with some of these OMRI certified um, herbicides. And I think on, on people's properties, you know, I don't think you have to worry about the scale of the invasives as much as you do on a land trust property. Um, so some of these alternatives if we test them and they work, I think they should be able to be used on, on, in your backyard. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, uh, this is more of a comment than a question, but uh, one, what, one person in the audience wrote in to say, the yellow sign is also posted for organic programs, not only for synthetic herbicides and pesticides. It's the state law that you use it for anything other than 25B products. So that's um, that's just a, a, a comment that to clarify about the yellow signs. Yes, that's absolutely true. Um, and in the past, when I had an organic service, they used to put it out there. Um, and I would say, don't put that out there. <laughs> I'm using organics, please. But they did confirm that that is the, that is That's the state, the state law. law. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the next question is, where can I obtain a pollinator pathway sign? Ah, so go on the um, website, pollinator-pathway.org, um, and search through the website, and you'll say um, it, you'll be able to pull down um, a link that'll say uh, order a sign. And um, we have actually, this is the first person we've ever hired to work for Pollinator Pathway, and she's working 10 hours a week just sending out signs. So we have somebody who will send you a sign. Okay. Um, so the next question is, how can you get local nurseries on the Pollinator Pathway team when you're asking people to use less pesticides rethink the lawn, and buy native plants. Those are money makers for nurseries. Well, that's a really good question. And um, what comes to mind is a, a nursery that I have here in, in Trumbull, um, Wakeman uh, Nursery. And, you know, years ago, he, you know, he's a young owner, and he used to say exactly that, that his all of those herbicides and pesticides and synthetics were his money makers. Um, and now you go in there and he has none of that. Um, he says, I just couldn't, I just couldn't continue to sell these products um, to people. So when he does ha have something, it's OMRI, you know, certified. And so we are basically curating nurseries that have organics that use organics and there are um, nurseries now that are converting over to only um, organic stuff and 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 purchasing more native plants so you know when you become a landscape partner on the pollinator pathway our landscape designer uh, a nursery um, we're looking for the people that are not using not selling the synthetic um, pesticides so you know, eventually, you know, we can talk to them about it. You know, and I'd love nothing more than to have a whole section at Home Depot with, with the ecotype plants and, and organic um, products. But uh, it's basically using the carrot instead of the stick. Like, you, you want to be on the pollinator pathway? You want some of our signs? You want us to encourage people to come to your nursery? Um, 
you have to stock these organics, um, you know, or you have to, you know, be an organic nursery. You have to kind of drink the Kool-Aid. Um, and hopefully some, some won't come on board ever. <laughs> and uh, some will. So we will help to uh, become partners with and promote those who will come on board with us. I wouldn't recommend using the phrase drink the Kool-Aid, but anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, um, next question. Uh, what do you recognize as some of the biggest challenges for expanding pollinator pathways? Um, yeah, that's a good question. The challenges that we're, that we are facing um, in, in Connecticut and other states is, is, is the pesticide. You know, the pesticide issue, um, you know, I know we have restrictions on neonicotinoids in our state. Um, some states don't have that yet. Um, and there are other things out there that people are using instead of neonicotinoids that are just as bad, if not worse. And so our biggest challenge is um, managing and trying to influence policy changes um, at the state level and allowing um, these preemption uh, laws to change so that people at the town level um, can have their own voice. And um, if we want to restrict pesticides at the town level, we, we just can't, we can't do it now. Um, so that is our biggest challenge. And right now the Pollinator Pathway Steering Group is working on with uh, Protect Our Pollinators, which is a group in Newtown, drafting um, a pesticide uh, brochure, um, advising people of alternatives, that the alternatives are out there. Um, so I would say right now, the pesticides are number one. Number two, the challenge is scaling up the availability of these native plants, these ecotype plants. And, um, you know, we've we're only got a year of it under our belt and it's really taken off. So um, that's a challenge. That's a fun challenge uh, to help to create markets for these truly native plants um, is a challenge, but it's a good one. So pesticides and native plants, um, you know, those are the two big challenges for us. Thank you. Um, so another question is, what do you mean by connecting the pathways? How far? Can the pollinators pass from one friendly patch to the next? Do they have to meet, be immediately adjacent and connected, or can they be a few yards or a few miles away? Well, that's a question that, that Kim, I think you could answer better than I could. Um, but I guess it, you know, it depends on if you're talking about bees specifically, the species. Some of them have uh, larger um, areas of foraging than others. Um, so it can be from 30 feet to 300 feet um, based on the species. So, um, you know, they don't have to be connected. I think it's more of a mindset. So, for example, my property is has always been organic. I've got a lot of native plants. My neighbors across the street, not so much. But one on the other side doesn't use pesticides. And so you kind of can, the, the concept is to, try and get people to understand how important it is to connect these properties. But um, it's more of a, um, you know, it's more of a movement or an understanding that um, to flow across the landscape, we have to have our habitats on our properties um, safe and clean for pollinators, for birds, and for us and for our pets. So, um, no, they don't have to be completely connected, but Tim, I don't know if you have a comment you'd like to talk about foraging uh, well, bees. Thinking about bees, so like some of the really small bees can go, can go a few hundred yards. So, um, you know, so like across somebody's yard, I guess. So like, yeah, on the order of a couple hundred meters. Um, but some of the some of the bees can go much further, like um, bumblebees can go like a half a mile. Honeybees honeybees can travel actually quite a long distance if they have a really good source. Of course, honeybees are not native, but so they're not the focus so much. But um, yeah, so on the order of of a few hundred yards to half a mile or so, yeah, bees can travel pretty readily. Yeah. 
All right. So um, another question is, how about piggybacking on a project that is already underway, say, to create a new park or walking trail? Seems like a good way to leverage influence. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a great idea. And that, that's kind of where this um, creating your team comes in. Uh, you know, look at what's going on in your town. And is there an initiative like that? Um, is there a new park? Is there a river cleanup? Um, get the people that are involved in that um, to, to kind of get up to speed on what this whole pollinator pathway initiative is. And, and yeah, definitely leveraging whatever um, projects are going on in town. Right now, maybe one of your parks uh, wants to put in a pollinator meadow or something like that. So yeah, that's definitely, um, that's a great rule of thumb. Yeah. yeah, I know like the Farmington Canal Trail, there are people talking about doing pollinator pathways along the Farmington Canal Trail, um, which is relevant to us here. Uh, yeah. um, what can be done to limit or eliminate businesses like Mosquito Authority, which are hired to blast a property with pesticides, killing not just the mosquitoes, but everything in their path? <laughs> yeah, well, that's where... That's where the, our biggest challenge is, is right there. Um, you know, the businesses that, that are out there and, and, you know, they're following regulations. It's, it's okay to do that stuff in, at, at the state level. And so the way to change it is to change, um, you know, the, po the policy and the policy change in the way that, you know, Kim and her team did with the neonicotinoids is just, you know, going to the science, working on it, and at the state level, putting restrictions in place um, to prevent this kind of stuff. I mean, how, how these backpack sprayers for these perimeter sprays for ticks and mosquitoes were ever approved is, is beyond me. It's like toxic hurricane force winds uh, coming across multiple properties. And, you know, that's a challenge for people who have organic properties or farms, organic farms. You know, they're surrounded by residents that um, have these companies coming in and spraying these uh, these pesticides around these teeth tick and um, mosquito sprays, and, and you've got spray that drifts onto uh, other people's properties and businesses. So, you know, the rest of us have rights too. And I think this is something that, again, needs to be looked at um, at the state level in changing policies, because uh, I, I agree with you. I mean, I've got somebody five houses away who uses that um, spray and I can smell it in my backyard. So if I can smell it, uh, it's affecting everything that it floats over. So yeah, good question. So, you know, join the team. This is our challenge. <laughs> okay. Um, that's all the questions that I have and we're, we're over an hour. So thank you very much, uh, Mary Ellen. And, um, uh, 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 I hope that people will continue to listen to the seminars, the Wednesday noon seminars over the rest of the semester. All right, great. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, take care. Okay, bye-bye.